everyone, um, after lunch slot. Uh, so I'm going to wake you all up with a video. Um, some of you I talked to yesterday, uh, the brilliant finalists here today, uh, here over the next couple of days. Um, so the video I'm going to share with you is a video that we did of the collaboration that, uh, of the Tempest with Intel. Um, and always I like to show it, that's my son by the way, that's my son's face. <laughs> Uh, he's actually in Helsinki, um, having a great time on all your playgrounds. Um, so yeah, that, that's a distraction now, so I'll get to the video very quickly. Um, but I wanted to share this work with you. So um, in 2016, it was the 400th anniversary of Shakespeare's death, and we wanted to do something really spectacular. I'm going to talk to you today about collaboration. I'm going to talk to you why it's important to work with different sectors, people that are different to you, people that see the world differently. And for progress or any form of change and, and um, innovation to happen, I believe that we need people that are not like us, that would ask the question in the same way or look at the world in the same way. And that's what I'll talk to you about today. I'll talk to you about the Tempest project and also the new work we've, coming up, we've got coming up. Um, so this is to whet your appetite around what you can achieve when you collaborate with brilliant people. Three years ago, we spotted that 2016 was going to be a big Shakespeare year. It was Shakespeare's 400th anniversary of his death, and the Royal Shakespeare Company needed to put on something pretty spectacular. We needed to try and match the magic of Shakespeare's imagination. I got cast a long time ago for this new production of The Tempest, and the RSC is the home of Shakespeare. Not many actors get the chance to do things like this. It's taken the best part of two years for us to develop this technology with Intel and create an avatar to make Ariel fly, to create a sense of the island being a place where magic was possible. I boarded the King's ship. You get to see two fully-fledged performances, one of which is an actor, and another is this apparition can fly around the space. To dive into the fire, to ride... We have unlimited versions of Ariel. We're able to change his form in many different ways. We are creating for the first time on stage, real time, live facial performance capture. And that is quite an extraordinary leap forward. I and my fellows are ministers of fate. The actor both becomes the marionette and the puppeteer at the same time. And you can see their physicality completely driving one-to-one -one this digital character. Men hang and drown. We keep working, keep trying to refine the way that Ariel moves, the way he talks, and I have no idea where it's going to go. This technology that Intel deployed here for the Tempest is big. Take real-time information from a motion capture suit map that on to a complex digital avatar, and then project that digital avatar out through 27 projectors. We have their desktop i7s to take marks, skeletal information, and a machine called the Big Beast, which has 120 cores. I've never seen a technical setup like this. This place is full of huge amounts of technology, much more so than most film sets that we're on. Generally, on set, you might say, let's fix that in post. You can't do that here. The avatar has to be so robust because that's the final product. All you can do is create the play with the tools that you have now. And what's delightful about this production is that we have pretty spectacular tools. affords us is the ability to encapsulate Shakespeare's vision, inclusive of all that magic, that wonder. The possibilities of what Intel have allowed are only limited by our imaginations. We're at the forefront of something that other people can take on and build. Who knows where things will be taken in the future. It's for other creative minds to see what we're doing and take it further.
<laughs> Back to the boy. There we go. Bear with me. I'm a technology black hole, to be quite honest. There we go. Right. Um, so hopefully that's woken everyone up and, and just got a sense of what we're talking about is the work. What we're talking about is creativity. What we are talking about are tools that are led by engineers and have been innovated by technology companies. But you put that technology in the hands of artists and unexpected and unimaginable things can happen. And it's that alchemy around co that collaboration and coming together around that is what that, that makes you achieve things that you didn't think were possible. So to quote another UK cultural icon, um, tomorrow belongs to those who see it coming. And probably everyone in this room has an invested interest in that. And that we are looking at new technologies and tools that are clumsy and awkward and difficult to explain. There are challenges with that. We're, there is... Um, there's a deep reliance on um, getting the technology to work um, for it to convince a consumer market. There are lots of challenges around that, but I believe that the people that think about tomorrow and are bold and take risk are the people that, when you hand that on to the next generation, you have made a massive difference in how this work has evolved and how theatre can evolve and how live performance can evolve. So at my job at the Royal Shakespeare Company, you wouldn't think, with the playwright being 400 years old, that the future is very much in our thinking, but it is. And what's lovely about it is that we know that these stories have been with us for the past 400 years, so they're pretty robust, and we know we can do quite a lot with that. We also helps us think about the fact that when we have new things come into play, like the printing press, or electricity, or candlelight, there are all tools and technologies. We're not doing something radically new here with virtual reality or mixed reality. Theatre's been working in virtual reality for centuries, and it's, it's about understanding that we are standing on the shoulders of giants, and that if Shakespeare had the tools he had now, he would use them. And it's thinking about how when we look back 400 years ago, when uh, we had a whole change of globalisation, the printing press happened, but it wasn't until we started changing from Latin to English and people's natural um, uh, languages is when the democratisation of the printing press happened. So it's another reminder to us that it's not just about having a piece of technology, it's what you do with that technology. And we look back at some of the performances of Shakespeare's day, and what's magical is we still don't quite know how they technically achieved some of the magic and wonder of what they did. And I think that's a really special thing to think about, is that when you come to the theatre or when you experience something artistic and creative that an artist wants to share, they don't necessarily want to look behind the scenes. They want you to, make sure, they want you to feel that what you've just done is impossible. So this is my home, and every night in Stratford, a thousand people gather around and have a shared experience. And it's that shared experience that has been with us for centuries, will continue to be with us for centuries, and the technologies that we're working in today don't disrupt that. This is a really robust storytelling framework. But what we do bring into that space at the Royal Shakespeare Company is new tools to help us tell those stories in that way. And our whole digital strategy is based around how do these news and tool tools and technologies expand a theatre-making toolkit. So we will make the decisions based on that, not necessarily... So if it doesn't work for us, we won't, in the terms of theatre, then, then we don't use it. And it's on that stage that we did The Tempest, but it's on this stage that we did our collaboration with Magic Leap which was any stage. Seven Ages of Man, performed by Rob Gilbert, was the first collaboration, collaborative piece with Magic Leap um, that we did last year. And that was a wonderful moment for us not to just think about our home, but the home entertainment system of Shakespeare's time was the theatre. The home entertainment system of now is everywhere. You've got a home entertainment system in your pocket, you've got one at home, there's the cinema we have here. So we're really full on the ways that we can experience theatre and where theatre can be. 
So to create a piece in mixed reality and have it performed on tabletops or in foyers or in bars or on stages is a massive paradigm shift for us to think about. Is how do we bring meaning and how do we bring wonder to all the home entertainment systems that you have available? And with spatial computing, that's what we're really interested in for the first time. Spatial computing has caught up with theatre and now we're able to imagine a 3D space. So the latest um, project we're working on, which Luke, if you were here this morning, alluded to, is an audience of the future collaboration with Magic Leap, Intel, um, Epic Games, and a series of um, UK arts organisations and universities. And we're looking at real... The, the collaboration is looking at how we explore real-time performance technology, looking at motion capture, vol volumetric capture and photogrammetry. We've all got really strong IP. We're coming from the place of our stories and our content driving the innovation. But we also have shared audiences. We talked about opera today in theatre. We share an audience. We're not that dissimilar. We really, our tribes meet every now and again. But we also wander off. And it's how we create some shared thinking and some shared objectives. So when we're looking at the RSC innovating, we can't innovate in a bubble. Our artists are everywhere. Our audiences are global. And we have to be supporting the emergent artists and the emergent um, performers and actors so that they take this forward and we're building an ecosystem to do that. Um, it would be a, a kind of waste of our privilege if we didn't do that. So just tangentially, we've had a series of fellowships with Magic Leap that are exploring the future of theatre and technology, and all of those fellows have never been able to work with us before, and that's a wonderful alchemy, and they will have a transformative year, and whatever they do will go out into our sector and hopefully create this ecosystem that we need to create diverse, interesting, challenging, and risky work. And it's the audiences, again, that we need to commit to, because... Audiences have expectations, and if we are in the world of R&D and technology, if that technology fails in this space, we have failed that contract with the audience. And it's about understanding what's research and development, and then what takes it into production. So going back to the Tempest, why collaborate? Well, Greg said on the film, it was 400 years after the anniversary of Shakespeare's death. And what happened was, he said, Sarah, what would a digital mask look like, because in The Tempest there's a scene in the play called The Mask, really problematic and gets cut, and he, he said, give me some ideas. So I went to the internet, as you do, and found this two-minute YouTube clip from the Consumer Electronics Summit in Las Vegas in 2013, and it was an Intel keynote, and they had this whale that was on the screen, and then that whale came out. Now. It was a trick of video, because it was all augmented reality, but I sent it to Greg, and he wrote back, I want one. <laughs> so there you go. I knew no one at Intel, and I knew I had no connections. So I emailed their customer service website in a very polite and friendly way and said, I really like what you did there. And they wrote back in two weeks. So we may not have the contacts, but don't ever not tell someone that you think their work is great if, if you've seen it. And do reach out to each other, because this, this collaboration was not strategic. It wasn't clever. It was a bit of chutzpah and a bit of you know, bravado. But also, it came with a really, really generous, good place. And so the report that we did for The Tempest just outlines a couple of things that I just want to share today that are hard-nosed tacks around collaboration, because we, we talk in a very esoteric, warm and lovely way in theatre, but there's a very, very hard line under that. We have to make ourselves sustainable. We have to be really rigorous with the decisions we make artistically. And we also need to make sure that we have a sustainable business model for this work to thrive. So on the collaboration, it's really important that we start with motivations and shared aims and those audience objectives and recognising what each other can do to make sure that we set that off properly. But one of the biggest things I found out in this is language. 
and traveling the world as well, recognizing that I speak in a certain way, but I may not be heard in a certain way either. And that's the interesting thing about it. But when we put different sectors together, when we put an artist with a technologist, you could be saying the same thing, but in a completely different language. And this is Stephen Brimson Lewis and Sylvia from the Imaginarium. And they, they basically designed Ariel and spent weeks and months just together sharing sharing ideas, sharing resource, <clears throat> sharing um, the pictures and designs of what they're interested in and, and, and brought that alchemy together because Sylvia had been used to designing for sort of these surfaces, cinema, and actually what she was having to do was design for 40 foot mosquito net moving surfaces, um, slightly different. And what we've realized is you don't need as much detail. And it's those sorts of really important things that you've don't forget how important that is when you get to the performance stage. So the relationships and collaboration are really important. And Intel, a company from Silicon Valley with no knowledge or understanding of our world and vice versa, needed to spend time together. So we had to look at what the partnership characteristics were, but also what was the project and what were we trying to achieve so we didn't go out of scope of that. But more fundamentally, and this is what we need to think about, is the process characteristics. We had to both work in a completely different way to what we do normally. We don't just go, right, I'll do a project and I'll fit it into my normal project management system. There you go. If you're, if you're genuinely doing something with new technology and something new artistically, you have to take a step back because there's going to be change within the process. And Greg said a really brilliant thing, which was, um, I need to know the questions and I need to know when I need to ask them. That's how different it was. So he didn't know when something needed to be locked down because in theatre we're locking it down till press night. But in this we didn't have that luxury. So we really needed to take a step back and understand where the vulnerabilities were with working with each other and also not making any cultural assumptions about, about what we were delivering. This is Mark Corsley and he is the most beautiful actor in the world because he took this gig on thinking it was going to be substage, never seen, um, which I think is really, really lovely. But the technology moved forward where, um, as you can see in the video, a very tight lycra suit with sensors in uh, through a Wi-Fi enabled him to be on the stage and that made much more sense for us um, in terms of the storytelling on it, of it. But Again, going back to the harder edge of this, for people to want to collaborate with you, they want an outcome. And yet the outcome that you want may be really different to the outcome that they want. And again, not making the assumptions, it's important to look really closely about why people would want to collaborate with you. And sometimes it's not quite obvious. So for example, what we were wanting to do was make huge, massive change and test certain technologies and demystify those technologies within a production framework. We wanted to innovate. Um, but important to that, there were some significant outputs that we, we achieved through that that we can take forward into our business and we can take forward into theatre making going forward. So the new workflows and processes means that we have that now and if we want to do it again, we have all that learning and kits and technology to do that. But we also know the methodologies how to do that and we know who to employ. And in this space, I don't know about you in terms of the immersive market, but we're all making those organograms up and the jobs up and we're, it's messy and we're trying to get that right. And I think that if we just accept that we don't know, but we need to have Evident, evidence through these collaborations that can help us and share that, those learnings, that's great. This is my favourite scene in the play um, because that could only, this could only be a piece of theatre. You sort of saw in the video, video there were lots of different scenes. This is the cloven pine scene and this is the beautiful Simon Russell Beale um, performing Air, um, Prospero. And he's reminding Ariel that he can put him back into the cloven pine where he had him stay for hundreds of years as punishment because basically Ariel's been really cheeky and spoken back to him. 
but you can see Mark in his human form and then his avatar, huge across him, projection mapped on top of him with this mosquito net. And in, in the play, you hear the sound of it constricting around him and it's suffocating him. And Prospero's delivering that speech with a passion and an energy. And, and it's all it is is demonstrating that anger and the fear and that. And then it flies away and it's gone. And that's a wonderful thing about theatre and live performance is the jeopardy and the real timeness and the togetherness and the convergence of what the text is saying and what the story is and what the technology is enabling that to do. And it's really important that every single decision we made about the technology was based on the text. And our audiences felt that and our audiences respected that. And what we were able to do was take a very sceptical audience that know a lot about Shakespeare because we we created that framework artistically for that. And it really hurt sometimes, because there was some really good stuff that got cut. It looked really shiny, but it wasn't allowed in. So speaking of audiences, let's not forget that when we look at collaboration, but let's not forget that when we make our work. Sometimes we get so caught up with the content, but we forget about the distribution. Content is king, distribution is God. Without your audience, you are talking to yourselves, and without a diverse and interested and an engaged audience, you're just going to talk to a small amount of people. And then you get cross, because you're like, why is no one coming to see it? It was like, did you bring them? Were they with you when you had the idea? And that's really important in the collaboration. We, we talk about the companies we're working with, but we don't always talk about the audience. And what we wanted to do, what we want to do, with all our digital work, actually, is use it as an expansion and a form of relevance and a form of creativity and a form of being able to speak to a generation where they might be disenfranchised and not think that storytelling is for them. They might not think these big ideas are for them and place these stories that are 400 years old in a completely new way. And with successful um, productions, um, that are genuine in their inclusivity and genuine in their thinking, we're able to make those change. And there's an anecdote from The Tempest which I'll share, which is um, most of the time I, you know, I get pretty obsessed when, when we make a piece of work. And I, I, I was on social media about 10 o'clock every night to see what people were saying about it. But I often asked a lot of young people what they thought their favorite bit was in the play. And 99% said the drinking scenes with Stefano and Trinclo. There is no technology in that scene. It is just actors talking about drinking, being silly, and having fun. And I think there's something wonderful about that, that actually we brought them in with that technology, and they came away with some wonderful um, fun and joy and playfulness in that. Another anecdote is one of our patrons came to see the show. She brought her father in his 80s and her teenage sons. And, and, she's like, and she came up to me and she said, Look, they really don't connect, but I took them to see The Tempest. And, and she's like, do you know what? They saw that together and the grandfather went, is that what you guys do with your gaming? And he went, they went, yeah. And she said it was like this magical intergenerational moment where they were having a conversation, a shared experience. Um, and it's about bringing that together. With these new technologies, with new ways of immersive performance, please let's not create a new disenfranchised voice. Let's not have people feel stupid. Let's not have people feel that they can't connect with this. It's our jobs to make that possible and architect that. Um, it's our job to make sure that people do not have a bad experience in that way. But off stage, what we were able to achieve by collaborating is doing things that we hadn't done before off stage. And for one day only in a wet November, UK rainy day, we did a Snapchat filter where you could aerialize your face. I said to you earlier, we reach a, a thousand people every night by coming to see a play. In one day only, we reached 7.5 million people on Snapchat. What do you do with that? And that's what I mean around content and distribution. Think of all these storytelling surfaces that we have now available to us, but it's not a broadcast model. It's a circulated, distributed model where we create a world 
of the play that is performed on the stage, but it is not like for like in the, all the other stages that we can inhabit. So when we create a piece of Magic Leap, we're not creating a play, a play in the traditional way. We are creating plays in new forms. And it's experimental and it's messy and we need our audiences to feed back on that. But what's important is we need to be in the spaces where other people are. And we need to be in the spaces where people congregate and then bring them back into the world. And if we bring people into a traditional theatre space, brilliant. But if we've changed someone's perception and they never tell us that, that is also true. So it was really important for us to make sure that theatre isn't catching up with the world of movies and, and TV and entertainment. Theatre's always driven this space. And I think it's about when we look at live performance, look at what's unique about it and what live performance can only do and don't get live performance competing with other forms that just are brilliant in their own way. And the lessons that we've learned through collaboration and through what we've done over the past few years is put people first, celebrate and recognise their expertise. They are brilliant. If they want to be part of this, then they are amazing and they may be different and make sure you welcome them into that space. The technology will come through the brilliance of those people and the innovation and the wonder will come through that. And the more confident people are, the more enabled they are, the more engaged they are, the more unexpected, magical results can happen. And also think about your culture. I think about that a lot in working in an institution. I think about that a lot working in a company, working with Shakespeare. And think about all those good cultures, but also bad cultures that can happen over time. And actually, culture accepting risk and accepting difference and maybe flattening the institutionalized hierarchy just for a bit to give that time in R&D to play could bring up something really wonderful. And also develop people that are leaders that are different. Develop those people that may not think they are leaders, but offer something really transformative to your business that you can work with and you can nurture and champion. And always measure your innovation um, to make sure that you can get a financial return. Laurence Olivier said, do two for them and one for yourself when you program. I think that's really true. You have to make sure this work is sustainable and it isn't fetishized. And actually, if the more that we think about the business model, the more that we think about the distribution models and sharing our learnings, there is nothing proprietorial right now in this space. It is all about generosity of spirit, sharing what works and what doesn't, because we have a collective responsibility and also a collective interest, I'm sure, in making this a success. Thank you.